We begin the second part of our study of the Minor Prophets with the prophet Nahum. So have your Bible ready and open to Nahum. And also in your course notes, we're on page 164. And you can see on page 164, the subtitle is The Doom of Nineveh, Assyria. And so this is another one of the prophets that's not really talking about Israel and Judah and their whole life situation, but it's talking about a foreign nation, in this case, Assyria and Nineveh. And what's kind of interesting about this is the subject is the certainty of judgment upon Assyria. There's no doubt Assyria is going to get clobbered. Of course, that happens historically in 612 BC when Nabopolassar and the Babylonians take over and defeat Nineveh. And then later on, Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Nabopolassar, comes along and takes Judah captive in 605, 598, and then finally 586. Um, Interesting historical thing. We talked about Jonah already. Jonah went and got these Assyrians saved. He went to Nineveh, preached, and they got saved in Jonah chapter 3. But that's about 100 years before Nahum comes along. So that generation in the day of Jonah actually repented and they came to faith in Yahweh Elohim and the whole Jewish system. These are Assyrians and Ninevites who got saved. But now, a couple of generations later, they're lost, and now they're going to come under judgment. So that's uh, how you resolve that, I guess what some might think is a conflict. Top of page 165, the key verse, For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob, like the splendor of Israel, even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. So we've got restoration of Israel in part because of the destruction of Assyria. Basic outline, some highlights there. Fall of Nineveh, as I mentioned, was in 612 B.C. Clashing with enemies results of the clash. Following the battle, the Assyrians are pillaged by their attackers and find themselves fleeing the scene of the chaos, deportation, despoiling, and and all these uh, declarations from the Lord. Habakkuk, page 166, the perplexed prophet. Habakkuk, he's uh, he's kind of a philosopher like Solomon was in Ecclesiastes. You know, Solomon tried to figure out, God, what are you doing, God? What's life all about? Why do you do things the way you do them? And why can't I find satisfaction under the sun kind of deal? Well, you know, that, that's Solomon, the philosopher in Ecclesiastes. But here we got Habakkuk who's uh, preaching, and he's got his concerns. And his concern is, is that the Judahites, the Israelites living in Judah, are wicked and sinful. And, and his question is, God, why aren't you punishing them? Why don't you punish us for being for misbehaving and being so idolatrous and immoral. And God says, hey, don't worry, Habakkuk, I am going to punish them. I'm going to send in the Babylonians. I'm sending the Chaldeans in to do it. You know, that's the Babylonian captivity is being predicted. Uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is not mentioned by name, but I'm going to send the Chaldeans. Well, then that prompts a second question by Habakkuk. Well, why are you sending the Chaldeans? We hate those people. It's kind of like Jonah. Why should I go preach to the Assyrians when they're such a rotten, lousy people who are so cruel and hateful and spiteful. Well, God has a reason for doing that. So he tells Habakkuk, look, I'm sending the Chaldeans so you can be punished like you want, but then later on I'll punish the Chaldeans. I'll get them good in the end. And that, I think, helped him uh, a lot. A key verse there, Habakkuk 3, 2, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear, O Lord. Revive your work in the midst of your years, of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So yeah, you're going to bring in the Chaldeans and, and hammer away on us, but remember to be merciful. And of course, God is. In all the prophets, he predicts, I'm going to punish you, discipline you, um, you know, you'll be in deportation. Following that's going to be blessing, salvation, restoration, nationhood, and all that. So the two great questions are at the bottom of 166. The first one, Habakkuk's first question, Lord, why are you indifferent toward the perversion of justice? Why don't you punish us? The solution, top of 167, Habakkuk, I'm not indifferent. I'm going to send the Chaldeans to judge the land. Question number two, the problem, Lord, why are you inconsistent in using an evil nation? He's suggesting that God's inconsistent in how he's going to punish Judah. You know, will they ever learn? So I've got some statements there um, by those question marks. Why would a pure God commission a malevolent nation? You know, why are you doing this? Malicious nation, these difficult questions. Why? Oh, why don't you give me answers, God? Why do I have to wait so long for an answer? 
I mean, this guy is perplexed and he's very impatient with God. The solution, Habakkuk, the wicked Chaldeans will meet their own with their own destruction in due time. And so there's woes on the Chaldeans there in chapter 2. And I've outlined them. They're greedy, arrogant, violent, immoral, idolatrous people. So, you know, God's letting Habakkuk know, just chill out, man. I know they're an evil people, but so are you Judahites. So we're going to bring evil to evil and get this thing cleaned up. Yeah, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Sometimes we use that as a call to worship. I've heard that in churches used. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. Like, is it time to worship? No, usually when God's quiet, it's time to run. It's time for judgment. Like in Revelation 8, 1, there's silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And then, bam, come more judgments. That silence in Revelation is just so God can reload his clip and go and start blasting away during the tribulation period again. And Zechariah has a statement, and also Zephaniah has statements about uh, the silence of God. Yeah, look at those. See what you think. See if they're worship or judgment. Okay? You, I guess you don't want God to be silent, or you don't want to arouse him from his sleep. Ooh. The just shall live by faith. Faith. Uh, nice verse here in Habakkuk. Talking about people who are already saved, they're already justified. It's how you live by faith. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. I want you to trust me, he's telling the Jews. I want you to live the way you've believed. You'll be consistent. And I'll send the Babylonians to help you with that. Uh, at the bottom of 167, I've got the three places this is quoted in the New Testament. It's a great verse. You're already saved. You're saved by faith. You're just, right? Live by faith. So walk in it. I got one prophecy, 168, millennium. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And all I'm saying is, that's never happened in the history of planet earth. That's certainly not describing the church age, where a vast majority of people on this earth have no knowledge of the Lord and don't want to know the Lord. They're stuck in Buddhism and other isms and... Uh, you know, Islam and all kinds of false religions. So earth filled with the knowledge, that didn't happen at the first coming. That will happen at the second coming. You realize in the millennial kingdom, everybody on the earth will know the Lord. Everybody. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 promises that. New covenant. We move on. Zephaniah. Deliverance in the day of the Lord. Zephaniah. Yeah, we've got three chapters here in Zephaniah. Time of King Josiah, you can see a little bit about the dates there. And again, certainty of judgment upon Judah and the nation. So Judah's going to be judged. Day of the Lord is coming. All that. Yeah, here's the statement, this key verse in Zephaniah. At the bottom of 168, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He's consecrated his guests. So silence before the Lord is a time to, uh, perhaps a time of doom. 169, prophecies in Zephaniah, tribulation period, the great day of the Lord is near. On the day of the Lord's wrath, he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Class, that's the battle of Armageddon. That's the tribulation period. That's in the end times. Because that prophecy, as it's literally written, has never happened in world history. All the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. It's not a metaphor. It's just real. Millennial kingdom, many statements here. Gentiles will find the Lord. They'll call on the name. Gentiles will worship and bring offerings from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. The Jews will be humbled. You'll never again be haughty. The Jews will live in truthfulness. Total peace, no fear. No one will make them tremble. The Lord has taken away all his judgments. Class, that's the end times. That's at the end. Jesus ruling on the throne, the king of Israel. Um, the Lord is in your midst. In that day it will be said in Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. In that day, usually points to the end times, even beyond our time. A whole bunch of these. Haggai, early voice for temple reconstruction. Remember, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, that's the end of the Bible. These are the post-exilic prophets after the exile, after the Babylonian exile, right? 
And we've already talked uh, in this course, and the Bible's talked about in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, you had Zerubbabel coming back and Ezra coming back, Nehemiah coming back to rebuild Israel and after the captivity and all that restoration stuff. Well, Haggai and Zechariah, these are the guys who are preaching during that very time. So I say an early voice for temple reconstruction. First prophet to be heard after the Babylonian exile. Date of Haggai, top of 170, 520. Significance of that is as we're getting toward the you know, the captivity ended in 536, get the temple rebuilt by 516, and he's preaching to, let's get this thing done. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, get the temple built, important post-exilic dates, building the temple and all this. The subject of Haggai, the continued restoration of the religious life of post-exilic Israel. And we've got some prophecies here. I've Battle of Armageddon, the second coming, millennium. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. See, I take that literally. All the nations means every nation on earth is going to be involved in some kind of war, some kind of battle. And they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And I've given you some interpretive ideas there. Haggai, four messages. This is the simple outline of Haggai. Two chapters, call the cleanness of, in life. The power of God, the presence of God, all these things going on in Haggai, but it's divided into these four messages. One's to Zerubbabel. Remember, he cleaned up the rubble. He cleaned up and rebuilt the temple, the, the second temple. Got the reconstruction done. Second to the Jews. Don't be discouraged. Um, you know, when they started rebuilding Zerubbabel's temple, some of the older people who were there who had seen Solomon's temple before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it um, were kind of grieved because it was smaller. It's like we didn't have a big enough building plan. Why, why is our floor plan so small? Why don't we build better, you know? And they're just kind of grieved about it. I don't think it was a moral issue. It wasn't a sin. It was just a thing that, they, uh, that was mentioned in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Third message to Haggai, deal with their pride issues. And the fourth message to the Jews, coming as a rubble-like figure. Haggai 2.20 Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai in the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overthrow the chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Look up idea. You're going to look to God. There's some doubts here, but Zerubbabel is going to be uh, have this signet ring, like a place of honor. I got a key verse of Haggai there. Go to Zechariah. Zechariah, um, we'll, uh, this is a long book. This is a prophetically very profound book, as I'll try to point out here. Zechariah means Yahweh remembers, and there's 27 other Zechariahs who have this name. Date of Zechariah, that 520, we're rebuilding the temple after the captivity. And then these important dates on the top of 172 that fill in kind of the, the historical spots there. And you've seen these dates before. Um, Zechariah, uh, the purpose of Zechariah to encourage post-exilic Israel to continue to work, you know, get restored, get your religion going again, be Jews again. You've been in Babylon for 70 years. Figure out how to live under the covenant again and the Mosaic law and uh, your anticipation of uh, being in the Holy Land. Uh, be a holy people. And that's what God wants us. He wants us to be a holy people. Be holy as he is holy. That's going to be the call of Zechariah. He's going to do this through eight night visions, which are some fantastic visions. I'll spell them out on the next page, I guess. Two sermons, two burdens. So if you're going to outline Zechariah, I mean, there's only one way to outline it. There's eight night visions, then there's two sermons and two burdens, like oracles, your version might say. 
It's 8, 2, and 2. Subject, the exhortation to finish the reconstruction of the second temple. Get that temple done, all the regathering. Christ in Zechariah in 173. Just want to show you here, uh, just in a simple table, all the places where we, he's called the branch. We know he was the branch in Isaiah 11, right? The branch coming forth from the stump of Jesse. He's God's servant. Uh, Isaiah also teaches that. He's the shepherd. Uh, Zechariah 9.9, 9, he's riding the colt, just like he did in Matthew 21, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 30 pieces of silver. You remember Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Piercing the hands and feet, returning to the Mount of Olives, removal of sin. Uh, Zechariah 14, I'll try to show you the millennial kingdom in Zechariah 14. Millennial kingdom is not just in Revelation 20. It's all through the Old Testament. Here's the eight night visions. Um, very complex. Uh, this is a survey course we're doing, and so all we can do is just hop and skip and jump from stone to stone to stone, and we do it in a table fashion. He sees a vision of horsemen on patrol. They're out patrolling the earth, and there's a message. A craftsman with horns, a surveyor. There's a man with a measuring line. There's another plumb line in here measuring Jerusalem. Um, that surveyor in, in Zechariah chapter 2 is particularly interesting because it's very millennial. Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. There will be no walls around Jerusalem. That's never happened in history. That's got to be millennial. When there's going to be no war, there will be worldwide peace, worldwide disarmament, just like the Bible teaches. The flying scroll, 20 cubits by 10 cubits. He sees a document flying around like a, like a window. As you turn on your computer and it's windows and there's a document there. And I always think of that. This thing's 20 cubits. Um, you know, by 10, 30 feet by maybe 15 feet. And it's got a list of judgments on it. The woman in the ephah. That's the idea of uh, a woman in the ephah with a lead plate over it. And then it, it's banished to Shinar. And it, it signifies the removal of Israel's sin. We're going to one day restore these Jews. Like we're going to stuff all their sins in this basket and put a lid on it. And then take it to Shinar. Shinar. That's where the Tower of Babel was built. The land of Shinar, the Shinarites, back in the early chapters of Genesis, built the Tower of Babel. So their sin will be removed. And then the four chariots. There's the cleansing and crowning of Joshua the high priest, which is a great story there of his, uh, his being purged from his sin. So that's the visions, the burdens, the first and second burden, are on page 174. And there's things about Messiah's first advent in the first burden, and then the Messiah's second advent in the second burden. And these are, that's chapters 9, 10, and 11, and then 12, 13, 14. Absolutely six phenomenal prophetic chapters spelling out the whole end times history of Israel. From the first coming and the cult of the donkey and all this. Piercing the hands is in here. The hand, they'll look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. Jesus comes at the second coming. And the Jews living on the earth at the time of the battle of Armageddon, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. That's a direct reference to the first coming when his hands were pierced. I don't think Zechariah, when he wrote all this, they didn't know what this piercing meant. They, they, didn't, they didn't even anticipate two advents of Messiah. But now we read it and we can see that burden number one is the first coming. Burden number two is the second coming. Tribulation period, second coming, millennial kingdom. I've spelled those out very specifically in chapter 14. And so when you get into my table of all these prophecies, it's just like backing the truck up and dumping all, you know, almost two pages of these things. And some of it is just very brief. Tribulation period, a day is coming. Gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's the Battle of Armageddon class. Battle of Armageddon, then, uh, at the end of the tribulation period, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone. In that day, I will destroy all the nations. That happens at the second coming of Jesus. Plains of Megiddo. Now we've got Megiddo. That's, that's Armageddon. Armageddon. So we've got a mention of it there, like the plain in Megiddo. And you can see all my underlining in that day, in that day, in that day. That's talking about the end times. It's not talking about the church. 
which couldn't possibly be talking about the church age, is if somehow the church has somehow taken over all these promises for Israel? House of David will be like God. Destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Anyway, surrounding nations. 175, the first coming. You've got, uh, he's riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey. We know that was fulfilled in the first coming. Second coming, he will speak peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is Jesus on earth, ruling the earth, physically on earth. This isn't a spiritual kingdom. This isn't a kingdom in my heart. This is real. This is territory. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It will be split in the middle. There's going to be a huge earthquake when Jesus comes again. It's going to split Jerusalem in half. And he will be king over all the earth. Now, I get kind of loud about this class because there's still that whole group of like what you call Reformed theology and amillennialism that just, they just don't see this stuff is being plain, normal, and literal. They don't see Jesus on earth ruling as a dictator for a thousand years. They, they reject that. And it's just to me, it's just a shame that there's a whole class of evangelicals who have a high claim on the Bible's inerrancy, but when it comes to these matters, they just write it off. It says here, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. What some of these reform guys believe, like Lorraine Bettner, he says the Mount of Olives, it's not talking about that hill outside of Jerusalem. It's talking about the human heart. And the splitting of the Mount of Olives, it's not an earthquake. That's when the heart is broken through, uh, through repentance. It's the brokenness of repentance. It's not really talking about geography. Even though in Zechariah 14, it not only mentions, in Zechariah 14, it not only says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and it will be split. But it also says, just like you fled before that earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. That's in 14.5. He's referring back to an 8.1 that happened 230 years before Zechariah. He's saying, remember that huge earthquake your ancestors told you about? That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes and stands on the Mount of Olives. See, that doesn't sound like the brokenness of repentance. It sounds like a real earthquake on a real mount called the Mount of Olives. Millennial kingdom, a lot of things here. Temple of the Lord, there's going to be a temple. Remember Ezekiel has that whole millennial temple. It's about a mile square. It's huge. It's beautiful. It's literal interpretation. You just accept it, trust it, don't adjust it, is the idea. Malachi, rekindle the spiritual fires. Malachi, page 176. Four nice chapters here. What a nice prophecy. My messenger. He's right at the end of you know, the uh, Bible, end of the Old Testament. The reconstruction of the spiritual worship of post-exilic Israel after the exile. Of course, we're now 100, maybe 110, 120 years after the exile. Malachi 3, 8, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Kind of see that as a key verse, that these Jews need to really be honest about what they're doing. They're supposed to give a 10% tithe. That's kind of a Jewish thing, giving 10% to the temple, and that's kind of their taxes and everything else. But they're supposed to give 10%. A tithe means a tenth, and they're withholding that, so it's like robbing God is the idea. Outline of Malachi, very simple. God's passion for Israel, I've chosen you. Uh, God's problems with Israel, you're disobedient. His promise, I'm going to come and I'm going to restore you. Just like most of the prophets uh, have talked about. Page 177, God's problems with Israel. The people do not honor God. In other words, it says animals there in your notes. They're bringing in their, their runt animals. Instead of bringing their best, unblemished animals for sacrifice, they're bringing the ones that are hobbled, the ones that aren't as, as perfect. And they're not supposed to do that. Leviticus says you're not supposed to do that. They profane God's covenant, intermarrying, intermarrying with the heathen. They're not supposed to do that. Don't marry strange women or foreign women is the idea. And they've been struggling with that. They, uh, there's unjust 
a lack of justice going on in 217 to 36 and they're not uh, you know dispensing justice maybe internally they're not uh, keeping their house clean their nose is clean disobedient to God that's withholding ties arrogant toward God is another part so th that's kind of the sin list that's God's problems with Israel and as you know Jeremiah had his sin list and Isaiah had his sin list and Ezekiel had his the prophets have to kind of tell the people what they're doing wrong and how they need to change. You're going to be disciplined and then you'll be restored afterwards. Two forerunners in Messiah, John the Baptist, is intimated in, in Malachi 3.1. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple and the messenger of the covenant. I mean, this is good news here. The messenger is coming. Good news is he's coming. Bad news is he's going to sit as a judge. I'm going to send my messenger. He'll clear the, clear the way before me. This is like Messiah saying, I'm going to send a forerunner. And we most people equate that with John the Baptist as we discover him in the Gospels. Now turn to Malachi 4, 5. This is a second forerunner of Messiah. Uh, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. There's judgment, repentance, warning. I mean, Malachi has us all set for the gospel. Because when you get into the Gospels, then 400 years after Malachi, then Matthew comes along. We've got this guy in the wilderness, this voice in the wilderness. And Jesus even said to those people, the Jews, if you would have accepted it, John would have been the Elijah to come. But because you did not accept John the Baptist, but he's now in prison and he's going to get beheaded, and you haven't accepted Messiah, which they didn't do in the first century, because you didn't accept John, I tell you, Elijah is coming and will come. That's what Jesus says. It's a shift in plan. It's a new program. Uh, John the Baptist would have been the Elijah. We would have got it all done 2,000 years ago. Be but because of Jewish disobedience and unbelief, it didn't happen. So that's the two forerunners. John the Baptist isn't mentioned by name. Elijah is mentioned by name. And by the way, I think this teaches that before Jesus comes again, there's going to be either Elijah or an Elijah-like person who's going to be preaching during the tribulation period, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. You know, we're, we're toward the end of the seven-year tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, the end of all things is at hand. Messiah's coming. So there, there will be another forerunner preparing the hearts of the people for that. Page 178, once again, some prophetic tables here. The tribulation period, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the terrible day of the Lord. First coming of Christ, the Lord will come into his temple. Okay, happened. Second coming, uh, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? I'll send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And then the millennial kingdom. For you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Selah.